It's now time for member statement. The member from Brampton North. All right. Thank you, Speaker. Um, they didn't call them the Brampton Thunder for nothing. Being one of the original teams in the Canadian Women's Hockey League, the Thunder were consistently a top contender throughout the league's history, winning two Clarkson Cup championships in 2014 and 2016, as well as making the finals in half of all the championship finals in the league's 12-year history. Brampton's a city with a strong history when it comes to ice hockey, especially women's hockey. Cassie Campbell, former captain of the Canadian Olympic team, grew up in and played for Brampton. She has a community centre in Brampton named in her honour and continues a successful broadcasting career. Jaina Hefford, another Canadian hockey legend, was also raised in and played for Brampton. She played for Canada's national team for over 17 years, winning four Olympic gold medals and seven world championships. She's also one of the all-time leading scorers in women's international hockey. Continuing our proud tradition, it's my privilege to invite members of this House to come on down to Brampton between April 5th and April 16th, where we will be hosting the 2023 IIHF's Women's World Championship at the CAA Centre. Today, fans from coast to coast to coast look forward to seeing the likes of Sarah Nurse, Jocelyn Laroc, and Marie-Philippe Poulin next month as they wow on the international stage. Speaker, uh, Brampton is a hockey town. I want to wish Team Canada all the best in April. I know they'll make us proud. Thank you. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, I'll be introducing a bill today on the issue of the next of kin accessing adoption records, and I will be reading two statements. Statement one, my name is Catherine King, and I am an Ontario adoptee of the 60s scoop. My father was born at the Andrew Mercer Reformatory in 1951 and was adopted. My children's aid file contained no mention of my true heritage. Thankfully, my biological father was alive to pass on this hidden information to me. Not everyone is as fortunate in finding a living relative. Therefore, it is time for Ontario to extend and access to post-adoption birth information, Rosina Ontario. Statement two, currently legislation provides identifying information to the birth parent and the person adopted only. Although this legislation has been very well received by the community and has allowed for many affirming family connections, it does not allow for the next of kin of a deceased adopted person to obtain access to their full identity and possible Indigenous, herita indigenous heritage as well as a next of kin of a deceased birth parent are prevented from connecting with family. Today, we ask you to take the legislation a step further to ensure that the next of kin are able to explore their full identity and Indigenous heritage, restore severed family relationships, and research deceased adopted ancestors. On behalf of Lynn Mayhew, Families of Incarcerated Women and Girls, Colleen Cardinal, 60 Scoop Network, Valerie Andrews, Origins Canada, Wendy Rowney, Adoption Support Kinship, and Monica Brin, Parent Finders. Thank you, Speaker. A member from Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last week, I was proud to attend the Community Living Mississauga's 36th annual tribute dinner at the Mississauga Convention Centre, which honoured my friend Frank Giannone, a visionary Italian-Canadian community builder who was among the first to recognize the great potential of building complete communities along transit lines. Frank has served as the president of the Ontario Home Building Association which recognized him at the Living Time Lifetime Achievement Award. But he's not finished yet. He's working to transform the old Texaco refinery land in Port Credit into the bright water, a modern, vibrant, and new waterfront village. Frank also founded the Port Credit Community Foundation and helped to organize many local events, including the Southside Shuffle, Paint the Town Red, the Waterfront Festival, and many more. Speaker, on Thursday, over 900 people attended, and over $300,000 was raised to support Community Living Mississauga. With this funding, over 200 children with intellectual disabilities will be able to attend recreational programs this summer. And I want to thank everyone who made this night possible, including the chair of the planning committee, Jack Previsa, and the sponsors, including Leuna Local 183, and most of all, Thank you to Frank Giannone for everything he is doing to help build a better Mississauga and a stronger Ontario. Thank you. A member from Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the International Panel on Climate Change released a very sobering report warning governments to act now as the window is closing very quickly to prevent catastrophic levels of global warming. 
This is a final warning before it becomes too late to stop a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperatures. The report identifies an increase in extreme weather events around the globe that are having a devastating impact on humanity. We are already seeing this in Ottawa, West Nepean, Speaker, where in the past six years we have experienced two once-in-a-century floods, a tornado and an incredibly destructive derecho. All of these events destroyed homes and displaced residents. And just this winter, for the first time, we saw our beloved Rideau Canal fail to open, hurting many local businesses and disappointing locals and tourists alike. But the report also offered hope, Speaker. We can still address climate change, prevent the worst outcomes, and secure a safer future for all of us if we act now. We have the tools and the knowledge of what needs to be done. What we need is the political willpower. As UN Secretary Antonio Guterres said, the report is a, quote, clarion call to massively fast-track climate efforts by every country and every sector on every time frame. Our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. We need this government to take that call seriously, Speaker. The solutions are there to reduce emissions, boost our economy, keep people safe, and hand a better world to our children. Will they heed that call? Member statements. The member for Niagara West. Speaker, last Thursday, our government, under the leadership of the Premier and Minister of Finance, tabled the 2023 budget, building a stronger Ontario. It's a serious budget for serious times. A plan that navigates ongoing global economic uncertainty with a responsible, targeted approach to help people and businesses today, while laying a strong fiscal foundation for future generations. It's a plan for building a strong province and a stronger Ontario, Ontario as well as a stronger Niagara. A plan that is working. Highlights for the Niagara region include expanding Go Rail service to Niagara by increasing current service levels and building four new and improved stations, as well as supporting local transit-oriented transit communities to build more attainable housing, twinning the Garden City Skyway over the Welling Canal to St. Catharines, and supporting the redevelopment of the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, as well as the new South Niagara Hospital. <laughs> Speaker, I could go on. The bottom line is this. Our government and our government alone is building a strong Ontario, whether it's more mental health funding, more new schools, more new local roads and bridges, more supportive housing, more jobs for auto workers, more nurses for our hospitals, and more support for our rural economic development. A strong Ontario means a strong Niagara, and this plan is a plan that supports the people of Niagara and our province today and into the future. Together, let's work to support and pass Bill 85 as soon as possible so that we can get to work and continue building a stronger Ontario. Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, last week, the Art Battle Toronto All-Stars competition took place in the Great Hall in my beautiful riding of Spadina, Fort York. The New York Post describes Art Battle as Iron Chef, but with paint. The whole evening is a blast. Music is pumping everyone up. The bar is open. The host, Tanya, stokes the crowd. Meanwhile, six artists are arrayed on a stage in the middle of the room with a canvas and acrylic paints. And when the battle starts, artists have 20 minutes to complete a canvas while the audience walks in a mass circle watch it and watches the progress. Meanwhile, the event is being live streamed while color commentators Morgan and Tyson provide pl the play by play, and people vote online and bid on the pieces as they are being created. Kudos to the artists who, in, the, in this incredible pressure cooker, created phenomenal canvases. Kudos to the winner of the evening, Julie Amlin. And even more kudos to Simon Plaschkis and Chris Pemberton, who held the first art battle tournament in Toronto 14 years ago and are now exporting it to Reno, Minnesota, Pawtucket, Pocatello, Mexico City, London, New York, Chicago, and 50 other cities. We're all looking for the, forward to the next art battle coming on March 30th to Ottawa and then returning to the Great Hall in Toronto on April 25th. Support local, local artists and have a blast. Come out to the art battle. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two weeks ago, I tabled a motion aimed at improving the safety of our youngest citizens. The motion reads that an opinion of this House, daycares, childcare facilities, 
should be required to report absent children to parents, guardians, caregivers, similar to the safe arrival program in our public schools. The idea behind this motion came from a dis discussion with a person in my riding named Sandra Camara. Devastated by the death last summer of a young boy who died after he was forgotten in a family vehicle, Camara reached out to my office. Camara, a daycare provider herself, for more than 15 years described being shaken to the core by the little boy's death. In a letter she wrote, it should be mandatory that a daycare center licensed and unlicensed home care daycare providers be required to contact both parents if a child is more than 30 minutes late. If they are unable to reach the parents or have not heard back from them in five minutes, the parents' place of employment should be contacted, followed by a listed emergency contact. This process would follow the regular school board processes where a parent is contacted if a child is absent or late or has not been reported to school. Mr. Speaker, it is often these meaningful talks that we have with people in our riding that lead us to positive changes for Ontarians. I believe my conversation with Ms. Camaro was one of these conversations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Member statements? Okay. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This time last Monday, the Sioux College Cougars women's hockey team was in Boston preparing to play in the final game of the playoff tournament for the American, American Collegiate Hockey Association Women's Division II National Championship. The team was set to face off against Northeastern University. After the heartbreaking 21-22 season finish, losing at the CHA, ACHA Nationals, the team was hungry to bring the championship home. Going into the tournament, the team was undefeated, a perfect 30-0, Mr. Speaker, no pressure at all. In the game, Emily Moore scored twice, while Emily, Alyssa Turcotte, Brooke Brezzo and Stephanie Pagnotta added singles for the Sioux. Emily Hansen got the start in goal. I am pleased to say that the Sioux College Cougars completed a season with a 6-1 six win, six win over the Northeastern team, bringing home the trophy for the ACHA Women's Division II National Championship game. Cougars finishing the season with a perfect 31-0-0-0 record, Mr. Speaker. The club started and finished the season on a win streak, the final number coming in at 31 consecutive wins. The closest games came when the Cougars ended up on the right side of a four goal game, two of them coming in overtime. They scored 229 goals, allowed only 22 goals with multiple players at the top of many statistical categories. Congratulations to the Sioux College Cougars women's hockey team for an amazing years. Thank you. <laughs> Member statements. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is an honour for me to rise today with my member's statement on behalf of the people of Scarborough Guildwood. For, me, for more than 30 years now, Not Your Average Daycare, NIAD, has been an integral part of the local community. In fact, it started in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. Over this time, the organization has done expanded and evolved offering a range of programs and focusing on accessibility. I recently met with the executive director, Danielle Wittick, and members of the NIAD team, and what I heard was deeply concerning. Their stories provided context to how licensed childcare in Ontario is facing the worst workforce crisis in its history. They spoke about the $19 wage floor for the RECEs, and neither, they can neither recruit or retain these workers as a result. So, Speaker, the severity of the situation can be clearly seen at the YMCA of Toronto's our largest child care provider, which recently reported that having so few staff, 16,000 children enrolled in a 35,000 licensed space facility. Across the province, child care programs need more support, and families are counting on the Ford government for help. So, Speaker, to Danielle and her team at NIAD, I want to thank them for all the work that they do each and every day for our youngest learners, and I urge this government to invest in the child care program, especially to those workers who need the help the most. Thank you. 
Thank you. Member statements. The member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. Each year, my region welcomes over 16,000 international agri-food workers from Mexico, Guatemala, and the Caribbean to work alongside our farmers and greenhouse growers to produce the fresh food that has earned a reputation for being among the most trusted in the world. I've been so fortunate to have met, learned from, and worked with many of these workers over the years. What what was first small groups of young men who had traveled to the area for short durations to support their families abroad is now people of all ages and genders who stay longer to support Ontario's critical food supply chain year-round. Our government is encouraging more people from around the world with in-demand skills and experience to choose to call Ontario home so they can support their families and continue to contribute and prosper as permanent residents and citizens. My community has benefited from this diversity and investment as bustling small businesses and a vibrant food scene has emerged in Leamington, inspired by Mexican, Latin American, and Caribbean culture and cuisine. Later this spring, Leamington's Migrant Worker Community Program, led by my good friend Martin Varela, will host its second annual Greenhouse Cup Soccer Tournament, where international players from area farms will come together to showcase their skills and compete in the universe universal language of sport. I want to thank all international agri-food workers for their valuable contributions to our culture, our economy, and for all the good things grown in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. That's a great statement. Thank you. That concludes our member's statements for this morning.